So first of all, thank you for joining us on today's webinar. We've got a full session here, so we're going to do our best to try to wrap everything up within the hour. Um, so having that said, we're going to get started right away. And really, again, like we said, thank you for being in the time of your business. What we want to accomplish is give you a, a full overview of all the different stuff that you could potentially do for your own online business in terms of driving traffic to your website. So some of you might have heard of these terms, and some of this might be new to some of you guys. But our job here, or our goal here today, is to educate you guys on how to best leverage the different digital marketing uh, strategies out there to maximize your ROI. So there are things like paid search marketing, and we're going to talk about pay-per-click and display and retargeting. There's uh, social media. There's email marketing. Uh, search engine optimization is, is always a popular topic that we, we love talking about. Um, there's this whole section on mobile and where that's headed towards. So we're obviously going to start off with that. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what type of digital strategies you decide to invest in, whether it's one or multiple. I mean, essentially, they're all designed to do one thing, to drive targeted traffic back to your website or your e-commerce page or your landing page or your social media profiles, whatever the goal may be. So let's just take a step back into memory lane a little bit. And Look at how the world kind of operated. And if we go back 50 years ago, I mean, we're probably, you know, if you're looking at this, I mean, it's probably quite uh, familiar to, to all of us here how back in the days if we were to watch television with our family, we'd kind of gather around the family room. And, and the scenario would look something very similar to this. Whereas today, if you're looking at how we're consuming media, so while we're watching television, we've got our laptops out, we've got our tablets out, we've got our, our smartphones out, um, all at the same time. And, and people online and even people offline, they are well aware of how we as humans now are um, dissecting all this information. This is why many popular TV shows now are often using things like hashtags uh, because they're making it interactive while people are watching their TV shows to interact with them online on a social level. I mean, one of my personal favorite apps is, I'm, I'm a big fan of The Walking Dead, and, and The Walking Dead's got this cool little app that um, basically while you're watching the show, you could guess how many people are gonna die that episode, and which weapons are gonna be used, and who's gonna get the most kills. I mean, it just makes it pretty cool and pretty interactive, when, especially if you're following a television show. So, anyways. How does this relate back to our world and our digital marketing? Well, I mean, if you look at how we are behaving online, I don't think any of these numbers are going to surprise people here, but it's still massive. Like, if you look at there's 2.4 billion internet users worldwide, and there's 2 billion searches done in Google every single day. So think about the opportunity to have your products or your services. If people are searching for them, and you're not being found, or if you're not or if you're getting found, but you're not converting that traffic into to um, to leads, there is a serious issue with your digital marketing strategy. So we're going to talk about the different tactics and how you could um, maximize your efforts. So I mean, when we talk, let's go again, going back to the basics. I mean, when we're looking at the internet and the World Wide Web. We don't want anyone to visualize it like this, where you're looking at a desktop or a laptop off a monitor. I mean, more, this is what the web has become now. It's us accessing the internet through multi-channel, multi-devices with various screen sizes and so forth. And where will the web head towards? I mean, there's already smart devices and vehicles these days and in appliances and things like smartwatches and Google Glasses. I mean, the technology is going so far in advance that, again, us as business owners, what does this all mean to us? Is there a way we could connect to our customers or talk to them or engage with them on any of these different avenues? Um, uh, there's, so this is where we talk about user experience. Um, Actually, I'm going to quickly pause over here. It's, it's, it's so funny this is happening again. We did a webinar yesterday, and there was a, a gentleman that came outside of my house. And uh, I, I'm, 
working from the home for the past couple of days because I'm not feeling too good. Uh, but anyways, he's, I just saw his van pull up. I was looking out the window, and it looks like our my connection might get disconnected. So if you hang on the line for about 30 seconds, this is so funny, I'm doing this. If you hang on the line for 30 seconds, I'm just going to run outside and ask him not to disconnect the internet. So hang on one quick second. Thank you so much. All right, guys, sorry about that. I just ran outside. He says he'll come back in an hour. So give me a quick second here. All right, so just, as a note, just so I know that everyone's still connected, could you guys quickly type in yes into the chat dialog? Okay, great. So anyways, going back to how this now relates in terms of your website and your experience. If you look at your website currently, and I don't have the exact stats, this was probably about two years ago or three years ago. Google predicted that almost 98% of the World Wide Web was not mobile friendly. Meaning, if you take your website and you load it up on your smartphone or your tablet, does it function well? Does it all the do you have to zoom or pinch and does everything look kind of clear? And Google also predicted that by the end of this year, there's going to be more searches done in Google Mobile than there will be done on desktop and laptop. So I don't think any of these stats are surprising because you can just kind of see where the trends are going. There's more tablets being sold in laptops these days. And uh, so, but you have to understand as a business owner, if you load your website on a mobile device, is it working fine? So. I'm a big, big Seinfeld fan, so I was like using this example. This is the episode where Jerry is with some lady, and he calls, he says she has man hands because she's got big, fat fingers. And I could probably relate to this because I don't have piano fingers, and it's so frustrating me as a user. If I'm on your website through my mobile device, and it's hard for me to download your menu or to click on the Conduct Us page because my fingers hit another button because it's just not, the user experience is just not there for me it really will have a negative impact on how I engage with your brand. So the number one takeaway or the number one fix that you need to do as a business is to make sure that your website is something what we call mobile friendly. Um, so there's a few things you can even do yourself to make sure and understand how are people accessing your website. We are going to be talking about Google Analytics a little later on. But basically, if you are using any type of analytical tool, which allows you to track and measure who comes to your website, how did they get there, where did they go, where did they leave, et cetera, et cetera, um, you, know, you could actually def find out how many people are actually coming through a mobile device. So in this particular example, let me just zoom in a bit. You can see that 29.34% uh, of all the traffic that came to this website in the last 30 days um, came from a mobile device. And you can see tablet and uh, desktop as well. In fact, you could get so granular that you could even see well which devices. And you could see first one was iPhone, second was iPad, then you got the Samsung Galaxy and so forth and so forth. We were kind of joking with this point that, you know, if you look at the top 30 devices that came to their website, unfortunately BlackBerry never even made the list. I mean, there's more searches on a PlayStation and the, more people navigated on a PlayStation to their website. But anyways, but you can just see how much data is inside your analytics that gives you a better understanding how are people accessing your information. So the answer to this is you either need to build, well, there's a few options, but the two main options is either you need something called a responsive website or something called a mobile website. So the main difference is this. A responsive website is essentially rebuilding your entire website, and it's done in a way that when it's rebuilt, 
that regardless of the screen size that someone accesses your website, so someone could come off a desktop, a, la a laptop, a tablet, or even a mobile device, the screen will up, um, screen and the content and the images will all automatically adjust so it fits nicely. Um, so it's only one content management system, which is good. So you're dealing with one website, one CMS, which allows you to um, control your entire website regardless of the platform. Whereas a standalone mobile website, that is built outside of your main website. So it's usually like a stripped down version of your main website. You probably take the most important information. So for example, if I was at a restaurant, the first thing I would probably have is contact us or then get directions and then download the menu and then offers or something like that. So you're not putting your entire website on a mobile device because most likely people that are coming through mobile, they want quick, fast information. But essentially a mobile website is just kind of separate. It's, it's built on its own and it's not attached to your main website. So if you look at the pros and cons of each, so when you look at responsive design, um, I guess the, 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 the biggest pro of the responsive design is the fact that you're only dealing with one content management system. It's still one big website that adapts regardless of the platform someone's accessing it on. Meaning, if I had to update my website or added a new blog post or added a couple products in my e-commerce store, I don't now have to worry about logging into one content management system and updating it there and then logging into another one for my mobile site and uploading it there. It's all just done under one console. So that's the big, big benefit of responsive design. The con of the the main downside is the cost, the upfront cost to get started. We all know the maintenance cost is much lower because you're only doing the work once, you're not doing it twice, but the upfront cost because it really is redeveloping your entire website. If you look at a mobile website on the other hand, since it's a standalone a site built outside your main website, these are very quick and easy to deploy. And the big pro is the cost. It doesn't cost you as, nearly as much as it would for a full responsive website. Um, but as I mentioned, the biggest downside is the fact that in most standalone mobile websites, you're now dealing with two separate CMSs, two hosting, and it, it's still all separate. So it's going to be double the work depending on how much maintenance and updates and stuff that you have to make to your main website, you have to, again, replicate that to your uh, mobile website as well. So my general rule of thumb, if you're still trying to figure out, well, what do I need? What should I invest in? If it, here, here's my general thoughts on this. If your website is, is outdated um, or you're not happy with your current design or there's uh, features or functionality missing on your website, it makes total, total sense to invest in a responsive design because you kill two birds with one stone. You get, you get an updated website with the latest technology, with the latest design and the features that you want, and at the same time it works across all platforms. If you're in this scenario where you have budget constraints or you just invested money in launching a, a new website recently, and hopefully it's not the case because I would say in the last 12 to 18 months, if you built a website, hopefully it was done responsive by the agency that you've, you've chosen. If it wasn't, then you might think like, look, I just put so much money into my existing website, I'm happy with it, but it's not mobile friendly, so I just need to build myself a separate mobile website. So that, that's kind of the scenario that I would use in helping to determine which ones to pick. All right, so let's just keep moving along. So one of the things that, and, you know, just so everybody on the call, anytime I mention the word keyword phrase, I'm actually referring to the search term that gets shown what someone types into a search engine. When I mention paid search marketing, I'm referring to the ads that typically show up on the right-hand side and sometimes on the top of the organic listing, which is the area shaded there in green. So just to give you a quick overview of the difference between paid search marketing, which is the red, and the SEO, which is the shade in green, Paid search marketing is basically what it sounds like. You're paying to be in those spots. So it's instant, it's fast, um, but, but the downside is the fact that, that every single time someone clicks on one of those listings, you're paying money to Google. And the amount you pay depends on a whole bunch of factors, but you're essentially paying for every single time someone clicks and comes to your website. 
That's why most businesses try or ideally want to be in that green section because it doesn't matter if I get 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 visitors that clicked on me today, I'm not paying Google every single time someone clicks. However, most likely, I'm going to be paying an agency or a consultant or you might have your own in-house team that's helping to optimize your website so it naturally appears there in that section in green. So there's a big difference. The red side, like I said, it's instant. Uh, you could be there today if you wanted to, or the green side is long term. It, it's, it's a process that um, in the SEO world, like I said, it could take three months, six months, nine months, a year. There are just so many variables involved in terms of you know, how, what are your keywords, how competitive they are, how does your website uh, behave right now versus your competitors on page one. These are all things to actually consider. So if you guys are doing paid search marketing, the number one common mistake that most brands make when they're doing paid search marketing is the fact that they send traffic to the home page of their website. In fact, according to Marketing Sherpa, 44% of clicks for B2B companies are directed to the business's home page. And I'll explain why it's such a crucial and common mistake that most brands make out there. But what you want to do, instead of sending it to your home page, you want to send it to something called a landing page which is essentially the first page a visitor sees when they come to your website. Now, that means basically any page of your website could be a landing page, because if that's the first page that they see, it's technically a landing page. But we're talking about a landing page that's designed and developed strictly for the purposes of getting a conversion. So again, just looking at some more data and more research, it shows that companies that build 30 or more landing pages generate seven times more leads than those with fewer than 10. Again, I wouldn't be worried about all these numbers and so forth. It's just common sense. The more landing pages that you develop that are better for the people searching for a specific product and service that match them more closely, the better conversions you're going to be getting, which is going to obviously generate you a higher ROI. And when we talk about a conversion, it basically just means someone taking a predetermined action that you want to track and measure. So for example, if I'm an e-commerce store, maybe I want to measure how many people are adding items to a shopping cart. Maybe that's a conversion for me. Or maybe how many people have actually checked out and bought a product for me. That's a conversion for me. On the other hand, maybe I, I, I'm not an e-store and maybe I want to collect people's names and email addresses so I can market to them. So again, maybe that is my end goal or my conversion. Or maybe I'm just an informational website and I want people to stay on my website I want them to spend time there. I want them to have multiple page views. That means they're looking at other articles I've been writing. And maybe I want them to even share it on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, so I know my articles are all relevant and people enjoy it. So maybe now that would be my conversion. So at the end of the day, every website has some type of conversion. And it's so critical. We're going to talk about Google Analytics, like I said, later on. But so critical that inside your analytics, you actually define what these goals or conversions are. Otherwise, it doesn't matter if you're doing online marketing, offline marketing, it essentially becomes very, very difficult to measure what's working and what's not working. So let me just walk you guys through a live example of kind of what I saw when we talked about landing pages and how they're effective. So I went ahead and Googled, and I typed in 42-inch Vizio LED television. Now, again, I'm not, I didn't type in something generic like television. I typed in, this is what we call a long-term keyword phrase. So clearly the person knows what he's looking for. In fact, I know the screen size. I know the model number. I know the make. I know everything. And if you look at the ads that I see, first one's from Walmart, second one's from Amazon, and the third one is from Dell. Let's take a look at these links. And if I actually click on each one of these ads, this is going to be the landing page. The first page I see when I search for 42-inch Vizio LED televisions. Let's take a look at Dell first. I'm going to go ahead and click on the Dell one. And you can see this is the page I see from Dell. Now, very quickly, I do see that there's televisions here. But I don't see anything that mentions 42-inch Vizio LED television. In fact, the first button here says 4K Ultra HD TVs, which is not what I was looking for. Then I see Smart TVs by Samsung, which is not what I was looking for. And then I see LED TVs, which, yes, I was looking for, but I had a specific model and make in mind, which I do not see. In fact, if I even scroll down, which most people won't even bother doing, 
somewhere down the middle of this page, I can actually see that they mentioned Vizio 70-inch LED smart television. So again, I scroll all the way down. It's even the wrong size. I wasn't even looking for this product that's most likely going to be out of my price range. So basically, Dell is wasting their money and paying for clicks on this specific keyword phrase, which is not going to ultimately drive them traffic. Let's take a look at Walmart's landing page. So I search for 42-inch Vizio LED television, and this is what I see when I click on Walmart's ad. You can see very, very clearly that I see Vizio, I see televisions. In fact, I see 42-inch, and I see LEDs, and they're all actually bolded. So it actually all jumps out. So this is a much, much better landing page that I am mostly going to convert because when I searched for a specific product or whatever it was, I was shown a page that actually um, displays what I was looking for. By the way, if anyone here has an e-commerce website, you know, just a quick tip, if you go ahead and change your pricing into red, it is known to increase your conversions. There's two main reasons for this. Number one, you know, just the color red, it's the fastest color uh, that travels to the, the human people, meaning that's the first thing that we see when we glance on anything. If we see the color red, it's the first that reaches our eye. But more importantly, this is more to do with human behavior and psychology, is as soon as we see red, it looks like a hot deal or a discount or a great buy. So there's just tendency to give you a higher or better rate of conversion by simply changing your font color. Another thing as well is the number one reason why people actually abandon shopping carts or e-commerce sites is the fact that people are looking for shipping information. So they might add their product to the shopping cart and they go to the next step and then they put in their zip code or their postal code or whatever they do but to find out what their shipping rate is going to be with the product. So again, if you want to avoid screwing your data with all these people abandoning your shopping cart, if you are able to like Walmart present the shipping cost up front or if you have free ship or things like that, it will definitely help reduce the amount of people abandoning your shopping cart. So anyways, having that said, here are some quick uh, landing page tests that you could do on your own websites to see is your landing page going to be effective or not. So number one, does it pass the blink test? And I'm sure you guys have all heard of this stuff. Like if someone looked at your website within three to five seconds, do they know what your offer is, why you're offering it, and why is it even valuable? Do you have an attention-grabbing headline? Do you have relevant images? Is your copy clear and compelling? So, I mean, you might be surprised that if you're looking at your website daily or multiple times a day, you might be able to navigate it with your eyes closed because you just know where everything is. But if you ask one of your friends or family members to say, hey, you know what, I just want to do a quick test. Could you go to this link and try adding this to the shopping cart or try or, or signing up for my newsletter or whatever the goal may be? You might be surprised how many steps it might take them to get there. So this is why you want to make sure that your, your, your calls to action, everything is very clear. Um, do you have minimized distractions on the page? We're going to talk about that, how Amazon does an awesome job at minimizing distractions. Do you have an optimized form? So a lot of people are, are trying to collect email addresses and so forth. Um, so if you're collecting email addresses, so the number one thing you want to do is obviously have some type of incentive. Like, what's in it for the person that's giving you their name and email address? Are they getting a free coupon? Are they getting an ebook? Are they getting a white paper? Are they getting access? Like, you have to give them something for it. Secondly, if you want to increase the, the probability of someone filling out that form, like I said, keep the form short. The shorter the form, the higher likely probability someone will fill it out. So if all you need is a name and an email address at this point, that's all you should ask for. Like, don't ask for their date of birth and their social insurance number or this or that or their blood type. I mean, maybe you do need that information, but if you don't, leave it out of your order form. At the same time, if you do have a longer form that requires more time to fill out, the people that do fill it out, they're going to be generally a lot more qualified leads that you're going to be getting than those people that are just simply filling out a name and email address. So these are things that you also want to double test. Um, also, just to improve the likelihood of someone actually giving their real name and email address, you want to have underneath like the submit button, you want to have something of the verbiage that says like we value your privacy or, or we don't worry, we're not going to sell your email to anyone. I mean, there's so many times where people are just afraid of giving their email address away with the fear of being spammed to death for life. In fact, I mean, 
I've even created myself a separate email account. I did this way back when I used to use Hotmail, way before Gmail, and I still use that Hotmail account every time I sign up for stuff because again, I would never want my main email account to ever start getting flooded with all types of unwanted mail. And chances are, if you've done something the same, like you've created a dummy account just to send emails to, you know, again, as a business owner, you want to make sure that you avoid the fear of people giving you fake addresses and give them that comfortable feeling that, look, you're not going to be spending them. So I think just looking at landing pages, how to make them more effective, I think the number one challenge or the issues that people make is on the landing pages, you give too many choices. I mean, this is just, again, just human behavior and psychology. We kind of have a magic number that we use is three, and we're based on a lot of testing that we've done. So anytime we drive or build landing pages, we usually have three different funnels. And we'll give you some examples of this. But again, if someone has three choices versus four choices or 10 choices or more, the person that only has three, it's a, the thought process of making the decision is much faster. I mean, the best example I could think of right now is, you know, when you're on an airplane and, and, and you have all these movies and TV shows and stuff that you could select from. I mean, I spend so long going through all the movies, looking at previews, looking at the shows, before I ultimately make my decision as to what I want to watch. Now, again, I'm grateful for the fact they give me all these options, but imagine if I only had three options. Like, regardless of the fact that I might not find something I like and I like having more, but I'm just saying if I only have three options, my decision whether A, I'm going to watch something or not, or B, what am I going to watch of those three, is going to be much quicker, faster than it is if I was given an option of 50 or 100 and so forth. So if we're looking at some landing pages, again, here's an example of what we did for Wonder Bread here in Canada. You can see we have three calls to actions on the right-hand side where we had a contest or they could win a home theater system. We were doing a product launch, so we were talking about their new product. And at the bottom right, we had to sign up for their, their email. So we want to collect a database full of people that we could later go ahead and market to. And you can see the second landing page that we built for them. Again, very similar. Calls to action are on the right-hand side. Um, and just looking at some other examples here, this is for all for gluten. Again, another company. We did a product launch. We did the funnels at the bottom. So it doesn't matter which. You can always test to see which kind of works better. This, in fact, was a website that we just launched on uh, the first or second week of June. It's called NapoleonGrills.com. In fact, this is a whole different. I mean. I mean you might want to look at this website if you're looking at different trends of design and, and the new way web, websites are now created. I mean, we know responsive is always a big, big thing. This website, like in fact, you have to, there's a lot of there's a lot of content and images. It's kind of it's, a, it's like a super duper long landing page on the home page. It's like when you you know when you scroll down and you keep seeing more stuff and more stuff and it keeps going. It's kind of built that way. And in the past, we were always like, hey, that's a big no no. You shouldn't. You, know, you should have all your content and your calls to action above the fold because people hate scrolling down, which it still holds true. But we found that before we were beginning building this website, a lot of their customers that were coming to Napoleon Grill, they were coming off tablets or even mobile devices because they were probably in the store researching, should I buy a Weber Grill or a Napoleon Grill or whatever it may be, or they're doing something you know, at the store level. And especially if they're using tablets, People love the love flicking their finger and scrolling that way, opposed to clicking on links and having to have the page render and so forth. I mean, you know, even though tablets have come a long way, they're still not as quick as fast in terms of their internet connection as a desktop or a laptop. So it still takes time to render out images and content. So that's where the user experience we have long landing pages on tablet devices, they just work out to be much more effective. Um, and again, just going back to the principles of, of, of our landing pages and so forth, this is a company we worked back in 2009. So super, super, duper old. But take a look at the three funnels. The first one is new to cruising. The second one is cruise before. And the third one is book your cruise online. So basically, it doesn't matter which one you click. Their end goal is the same thing. They want you to give them their credit card information and book a cruise. So take a look at how they're segmenting their audience and their visitors to get them there. So if you're new to cruising, that would be someone like me, which I've never ever gone on a cruise before, I would most likely click on this link and it would tell me things like, okay, here's some, you know, it would talk to me as a beginner, like, 
here are some things you need to know, here are some safety tips, here are some things that you need to bring, here's what you could expect, and, and so forth and so forth. If you've cruised before, you don't have to be spoken to that way, and in fact, you're spoken to a whole different way, where it would say something like, okay, here's what our cruise lines offers, we have, you know, we have this, 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 compared to other cruise lines. The end goal is the same, so even when I took new to cruising, the call to action would be, speak to one of our consultants and we can help pick a package rate to you. Or if I have hit cruise before, you sell them all the features of your cruise, and again, pick up the phone, give us a call, and we'll help, we'll help you make a decision. And if you've already made your decision, you have your credit card in your hand, that's what that third funnel is, book your cruise online. This is you've ultimately made the decision and just go ahead and proceed to the online booking. So again, three different funnels of how you're capturing the same goal. Um, conversions, again, just going back to cooking on e-commerce, there's so many things you can do on e-commerce. So obviously if you have better images of your product, if we talked about listing the price and putting the price in red, showing how much money you've saved, you could even cross sell people that bought this product and bought that product. I mean, this stuff has now become pretty standard stuff when it comes to e-commerce stores and e-commerce technology. So you want to make sure that if you if you have an e-commerce site, and again, there's nothing wrong with PayPal. You know, PayPal is great, uh, especially for something. But we wouldn't really call it e-commerce. It's like it allows you to process and, and, and sell your products online, yes, but it's not a full like e-commerce suite that allows you to do all these neat little things like put in coupon codes and so forth and so forth. So if that is important to you, you definitely want to invest in a full e-commerce suite. Um, just on that level, I, I think one of the best people when it comes to conversion out there is Amazon because they spend millions of dollars just testing different things like, hey, if I put the shopping cart with a yellow button opposed to a red button, does that one convert better? Or if I put a 3D bevel with a little shadow, does that button pop out more enticing someone to click on it? Like they test every little minute thing. And again, if you are in the process of developing your site, if you kind of mimic like their, their format, their scheme, it's not going to cost you millions of dollars. Like again, how much is it going to cost you to change your price color from black to red? Right? It's, it's things like that which you could leverage off the bigger brands that have done the testing that are doing the testing so you can maximize your conversion strategies. But here's how Amazon is so cool. And once I show this to you guys, you probably don't even realize this has happened to you if you shopped on Amazon. But now that I've pointed out, you'll probably see, oh, I, I, I didn't realize that because you're so effective of doing this. So here's a screenshot of when I went to Amazon.com and I just typed in like Harry Potter. And so you can see that you know, it's got all the things that you'd expect. It's got like the photos, it's got the title, it's got reviews, it's got the price in red. And they've got a button that says add to car and it says free shipping, all that good stuff. So if I go ahead and hit add to cart, take a look at what happens. So number one, it says one item added to cart on the right hand side. It even tells me my order and one item added to the cart. At the top it even has the cart here with one item there. One of my biggest pet peeves of e-commerce sites is when you add something to the cart and you don't even know if it got added. Like the page, like, did that even refresh? Like, did something even happen? And then you do it again and again, and next thing you know, your cart's filling up. But you don't even realize it as a user because it's not clear to you that something actually had happened when you added it in the shopping cart. The second thing that I, I, I find pretty annoying, or I, I actually don't know why it's been set up this way for some of these, these websites we see, is when you add an item to the shopping cart, it automatically kicks you up to the checkout process asking you for your credit card. Well, what if it wasn't done shopping? That's like going to a grocery store, you pick up a bag of milk, and they're kicking you out to the cashier. But what if you want to get like bread and cereal and all sorts of other things, and you weren't done at your shopping experience? So you can see what Amazon is doing here is, once you add the item to the shopping cart, you can still see that they have their full navigation, they have all, you can shop by department, you can still do searches, you can still see all the deals, you can still see specials like Father's Day and blah, 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 blah. You can still see people that bought this book and bought this book. So they're giving you all types of, in this case, we wouldn't call it distractions, but they're giving you all types of stuff that they're marketing you with in efforts for you to keep filling up your shopping cart with more great things. So it's smart of Amazon to do that. Watch what happens very carefully when I hit proceed to checkout. When I hit proceed to checkout, keep in mind, remember that I've got the search, I've got the navigation, I've got the menu, I've got all this stuff, but if I already made my decision, you know what, I, I actually, hang on, 
I just got a notification that you someone has lost sound. So I just want to make sure if it's just an individual or if everyone else could still hear me. So if you, again, just type in yes if you can still hear me. Okay. Okay. Looks like the audio is good. Um, so that that's fine. So watch what happens when I go and click on proceed to checkout. Watch what happens to this entire screen. Everything just goes away. It's blank. It's clear. So in fact, there's not even any links anywhere with the exception of signing in and forgetting your password and, and these links that I'm showing at the bottom. Amazon has stripped away the entire navigation menu. They've stripped away all distra distractions, all offers. In fact, you know how you could click on the logo at the top left to go back to the home page? They even purposely remove the link behind their logo because they don't want you to go back and make changes or anything. You make the, all they want at this one point is your credit card information and for you to sign in. In fact, if you did want to go back, the only way to do so is if you physically click the back button on your browser. So they're kind of forcing you to do it, but they're not giving you an easy way out, which is very, very smart of them. So they made this page so clear, so focused that there's no confusion as to what the person needs to do to go to the next step. In fact, again, if you have an e-store, if you show the steps like sign in, shipping and payment, gift option, and then place order, so you're parts. So you're at step one of four, then two of four. I mean, if you could show that up front, again, it just helps from a conversion perspective because people like that warm and fuzzy feeling as to what's happening next. They kind of want to know how long is this process really going to take me. So having that said, there's a couple things that you guys can do. If you do want to test to see, well, look, how do I know what's going to be the best ad copy or, or what's going to be the best product shot or what's the best call to action? Well, there's something called multivariate testing, meaning let's just say I had a landing page, which I had a heading, but I had three different headings. So maybe one that said, you know, BMX bike, or the other one that said, awesome, awesome bike, or whatever. You know, I picked three different headings that I want to use to describe the bicycle I'm trying to sell. And maybe I've got three different product shots of the bicycle. And maybe I've got some different descriptions. And maybe I've got three different calls to action. One says order now, one says get it now, and one says buy now. And I want to figure out which one of these are going to be the most effective in terms of getting people to actually buy the product. So what multivariate testing allows you to do, and there's platforms out there that allow you to do this. You can speak to your local consultant that brought you to this webinar if you want more information on this. But essentially what would happen is, let's just say all 400, some of you that are on the webinar today, if you guys all came to my landing page, all, all of you guys would actually see a different heading a different image, a different, well some of you might see the same stuff, but it just kind of randomizes it. So it uses all these variables and randomizes what every individual will see. And it will track the measure over time. And when I say over time, this all depends on how much traffic that you're getting. So there's no such thing as testing it for like a day, a week, a month. I mean, we always base this amount, a significant amount of traffic to help you make an informed decision as to what's working and what's not working. And essentially, the platform can tell you that, look, heading number two with image number three with this bicycle with this color, with this description, and the get your bike now work the best in terms of getting most people to click and buy. So it, it just kind of helps you split test and do different types of things as to what works and what doesn't. So on that note, this is where we talked about Google Analytics and tracking and measuring. I think one of the, you know, a lot of businesses out there are using Google Analytics or they have Google Analytics. Uh, but the biggest challenge that when we're speaking to businesses is they don't really get what's going on in there. They're like, yeah, I get these nice little dashboards and these pie charts and these nice little graphs that kind of show me my traffic, but what do I do with all that information? Like, what does it really mean to me as a business owner and what should I do to improve my, my website or whatever the goal may be? And again, this is where your local consultant can help you dissect and understand what's happening with your analytics to give you some real business recommendations as to what needs to be done. But if you're looking at your Google Analytics yourself, here are some of the top things that I would look at initially to, to see how my website is performing. Number one is like your traffic source. Like when you're getting a thousand people coming to your website, for example, how are they finding you? Are they finding you through direct, uh, direct traffic source, meaning that they typed in www.yourdomaining.com and they came to your website that way? 
I mean, this is important, especially if I was doing like a TV, uh, a TV ad or a radio ad, or I did some type of brand, like offline marketing where I'm telling people to come to my website. I would want to know, did my direct traffic go up as a direct result of me doing that campaign? Search engines, I mean, are, is your traffic coming through search? So if you're paying a local agency or a consultant, or if you're doing it in-house yourself, you want to measure your search traffic. Is that increasing over time? So you'll know, are you getting ROI or not? Referral traffic, I mean, are you getting links and traffic and conversions from other websites that are sending you traffic? So for example, let's just say I found a, a magazine approached me and said, hey, Voltage, how would you like to, you know, we get 20,000 visitors to our website a month. How would you like to have one of your showcase your webinar uh, on, on some banner ad? And uh, you know the, the people that come to our website, they're B2Bs and they're B2Cs and they're blah, 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 blah. And, and I think it'd be a great fit for you. I'm like, okay, let's, let's do that. So I go ahead and I pay them. I cut them a check for 10000 bucks or whatever they're asking for. And I now I have a nice little banner ad on their website in efforts to drive me traffic and conversions. Well, I would be measuring my referral traffic. I would want to know how much traffic did I get from that source and how many conversions did I get from that source. Um, because otherwise I'll never know, did my $10,000 investment justify an ROI? Uh, other things you want to look at is your entry page. So what is the first page that your visitor saw? I mean, again, if you were getting traffic to your website and traffic is not your issue, but you're not getting people to take the right action, like conversions, you want to first see, well, what's the initial page that they're looking at and why are they not going to step number two? Like, where are they going after that and how can I make that page better to uh, get users to go where I actually want them to go to? Which kind of leads to the third one, which is visitor path. So if someone went to my e-commerce site, 100 people went there, 50 people out of the product to the shopping cart, 20 people gave me their billing information, and 10 people bought the product, which is great. But I'd want to know from the 10 people that bought my product, the 20 people that put their billing information, well, where do those other 10 people disappear to? Well, how do the 20 people that put my billing information in, but the 50 people that initially added the product to the shopping cart, what happened to those 30 people? Why did they abandon my shopping cart or whatever my goal was on my website? This is where funnel, looking at your funnels and your visitor path and your analytics can help dissect and understand where your people are going which leads you to exit pages. Like, where are people actually leaving on your website? It's okay to have exit pages because, of course, no one's going to camp on your website forever. They have to leave sometime, but it's depending on where they leave. So if you've created a, a landing page strictly for your page search marketing campaign, but that has the highest exit page, there's a big, there's something critical there uh, that you need to look at. So it's either A, is my landing page not effective that when people are getting there, they're not seeing what they want and they're in the back page? Or B, is my ad copies, what I'm get, telling them to go there, is that not having the same message or the same verbiage that it's misleading that they're thinking they're going to see something else when they get there, but they're not? So these are things that you obviously want to take a look at. Um, just some more advanced stuff, what we could do is on top of your analytics, we've done this for a lot of brands where we look at heat map and eye signals to see where are people actually physically looking, and especially on the tablets now, where are they actually clicking and scrolling and how far down are they going. So we've got different technology that helps us to analyze this. I know that's going to look a little funky right now with all these little dots on the page, but where all those little dots indicate on this landing page is where people have physically clicked with their mouse or their finger. And all those colors on the page, they actually coordinate to, in this case, we're, we're segmenting it by referral source. So we know that everybody, all those, those colors in orange, they're from Google. All the ones in the lighter yellow, they're from direct, and so forth and so forth. But at the end of the day, this is how I, I would use this data. If I just did a radio ad, and I want to only look at when, when those people that heard my radio ad, they came to my landing page or my website, how did they behave? How did they act? Where did they go? I mean, this is some great, great information for you to understand how people are behaving on your website. And it even allows you to get so much intel, like what products should you put first? Because if you know that one product is getting a lot more clicks than another product, well, maybe you put that as your featured product, or you move it up the category list, or, or just things like that. It gives you a lot of great data that gives you good business decisions as to what to change to your website. All right. so. 
Next section is display ads and retargeting. So you guys might not be familiar with the term display ads and retargeting, but there's a strong, strong probability this has already happened to you. And when I kind of explain it, you might be, aha, that makes sense. But what display ads and retargeting essentially is, is if you go to a specific website, so I'll use me as an example. Um, let's just say I went to Audi.com. I was checking out their vehicles. I went to their car, uh, car section, and maybe I was even looking at a specific model, like the Audi R8. That's actually one of my favorite cars. So I was checking out the Audi R8 Roadster, and I was playing about the features and so forth. And then one thing, I was on the website for quite a bit of time, but you know what? I decided to leave the website. I, I didn't become a customer or anything. I had other things to do. I got distracted, and I left. So after I leave the website, now later on in the day or maybe even later on in the week, I'm going ahead and I'm checking my Gmail or I'm looking at the latest FIFA scores for, for World Cup and I start to see these ads popping up on other people's websites, websites that I frequently go to which is showing me the exact model, the same color, the same car that I was looking at and it's asking me to come in for a test drive. Actually, I don't think the the audio area to let you test drive that, but the, you, you get what I mean. It's just re, this is what we call retargeting, where they're actually trying to get your your bringing brand awareness in front of your customers again in efforts to capture their interest, and they come back to your website and they convert into a loyal customer. So there's definitely an art and a science to this. So if you could just imagine that when you're on someone's website, you might have noticed that now when you're going across the web or you're watching YouTube videos or you're on Facebook, you start seeing their ads pop up, the chances are it's because they're retargeting you. And which is okay to do, but we always say there's an art and a science behind this. You don't want to be intrusive. We've seen brands go overboard where, in fact, like it's kind of like stalking people. We're like, look, you can't do it that aggressively. If people are not engaged, once you start retargeting, if they're not taking any action, you should cool it down. Like, Don't be in front of their face in every single place that they go. Uh, so a good example of this is a company that we just started talking a couple of weeks ago and now they're one of our clients and they just launched a new product in which they created this chocolate milk that's like 100% organic, it's gluten free, it's dairy free and all sorts of good stuff in there. And they're like, look, we know we've got a great product and it tastes well, how do we get this product out to market? Like how could we do this product launch and get people to even know that we exist? I mean, sure, there might be some people going to Google and typing in healthy drinks or healthy uh, chocolate milk or gluten-free chocolate milk or dairy-free milk. Sure, I'm, I'm, I guarantee there's searches, but that's not going to hit the mass, mass audience. And they're obviously trying to target people that have, enjoy a healthy lifestyle, they exercise, they care about what goes into their body. I mean, they're not trying to convince people to do this stuff. They want their product in front of the people that have already made the conscious decision of this is how I want to live my life. So how do you get in front of them? And this is where display and retargeting can be so, so effective because not only if someone comes to your website, you can do something called search retargeting or behavioral retargeting, where if we know if they like certain things, we can always have their ads pop up. So for example, if I was checking out like gluten-free recipes on foodnetwork.com or healthy recipes, just imagine if I start seeing their ads reappear for Mayisa and their, their chocolate milk and so forth. Great, great brand awareness, and this is the slide that we actually shown them. Like, look, we could get you your ads on like the Food Network and the Food Channel and Eating Well and Rachel Ray and all Recipes.com. I mean, this is the power of our network. I mean, we could, as a collectively as a group, we could get in front of about I think it's like 98 percent of all the websites out there on the web, the major websites. We could actually have your ads in front of. That's how big the network is. So regardless of if you're in the health vertical or you're in the, the sports vertical or maybe you want to target by geography or demographics or gender or, or income level, there's a way that if you know your target audience of who they are and of what they look like, we can make sure that your ads are seen in places where they would actually hang out. Okay, so the next section, the last chunk of this is the search engine optimization section. So. I know we're approaching close to the, the top of the hour, so I'm going to still just hammer through this stuff. Um, and hopefully, if we could stick around for a couple extra minutes, I don't think we'll be longer than 10, maximum 15 minutes over the time that I thought we'd be finished at. Um, but just looking at, um, before we begin with the SEO stuff, just very quickly, because I know it's very common, a lot of people use WordPress sites. 
the two most common plugins for WordPress are Yoast and All-in-One SEO Pack, which they're both great plugins to use, but just if you are using the All-in-One SEO Pack, there's a big security flaw in that plugin uh, last month that was acknowledged where it opened the door to hackers and intruders and they could do all types of crazy things to your website. Anyways, the point of this is that all in one SEO, they quickly released an update to this plugin so your website is not vulnerable. So we strongly recommend that if you have this plugin on your website, or if you're unsure that you don't have this, if you're not even sure if you have it and you have a WordPress website, either contact your webmaster or your local consultant speak with them and make sure that this plugin does get updated. And if you're, if you're the admin of your own website, you can always log into your WordPress admin console, go to the plugin section, and update to the latest version, which will solve that problem. Okay, so I guess the number one question that we always get asked when we're doing optimization for clients and brands is they come up to us and say, yeah, we want to be ranked number one in Google for a keyword phrase. And we're like, okay, that's nice, but do you generally deserve to be ranked number one in Google? And we honestly mean this and ask this because this is what Google is deciding who gets to be on page one of Google. So, for example, if I'm a dentist in, a, uh, in, in Toronto and I want to be found for someone types in family dentist, dentist for kids, uh, safe dentist, teeth whitening services, like I'm just thinking about all these keyword phrases that someone might potentially type in to find my business, well, which is great. So the first thing I would know is, okay, do you generally deserve to rank that? Do you have enough content, enough inf information that tells Google, Google that you're a resource for this? So for example, do you have the types of services that you offer? Do you have like root canals and, and teeth whitening and braces and retainers and jaw surgery and TMJ and all sorts of stuff that dentists typically do and teeth cleaning? And then a lot of great content that talks about them and then even have some other content like, you know, here's three things to know before you visit your doctor, or five things to avoid, or five foods that are going to damage your teeth, or here's how to clean your teeth naturally, or just things like that, how to brush. And I'm just giving examples of all this type of content. And it's not just in the form of text. You could have images. You could have customer testimonials. You could have videos talking about your procedures. You could have infographics that kind of shows the evolution of like the toothbrush of how it can be all sorts of stuff like that which are all helping build the theme to Google that look they are a dentist they've got great content people like it people are sharing it which leads us to the next point where Google actually tracks and measures to see are people spending time on your website so for example if I'm ranking number one in Google for dentists in Toronto and all you guys came to my website today and majority of you guys, like 90% of you guys, stayed on my website for within five seconds. You decided, no, nope, that's not what you want. You hit the back button and you leave. And then you go to the number two website in Google. You click on that person's link and that dentist. And you decide to, there, to stay there for a couple minutes. And you look at a couple pages and so forth. Well, all of a sudden, you've indicated to Google that my website, I do not deserve to be ranking number one in Google. Because clearly, you're coming there. You're not finding what you want and you're leaving. So if this is a trend that you're finding that's happening on your website, you are going to lose rankings. This is why now it's not just about content, even though content is a big, big factor, but now it's about your website, your layout, your navigation, your user experience, your design. All that stuff has to come into play now when you want to rank well in the search engines. And then on top, are people taking your content and generally sharing it across like Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and LinkedIn and so forth, because this is what helps build what Google calls social signals, which is a, a factor of many, many factors that Google looks at, but it's still a strong factor of how your website is going to be ranking. Um, another very common thing that we're hearing and we're avoiding is something called link building. So if you're exploring a digital agency right now and, and you're looking for SEO services and you have companies coming up to you and saying, we will build you links and you might just want to be very careful of, of, of how they're building these links. So we have actually moved away from the term link building, and we use a new term called link earning, where we're actually building genuine links that are either A, going to drive relevant traffic to your website, or from trusted sources that Google understands what your business is really about. And the reason being that we've changed this, so anyone in the SEO space, you're probably familiar with these two animals, which is penguin and panda. 
if they're not, this is new to you. These are basically names that Google has given. Some of the two major, major algorithm updates they've implemented over the last few years, which has changed the world of SEO and how we do optimization for our clients and so forth. So again, there's just so many updates that happen. This is a big snapshot uh, of, of some of the major, major updates that have happened over the past couple of months. Um, and again, you as a business owner, I mean, really, you don't have to sit there and worry about these dates and know about penguins and pandas and all these different algorithm updates. I mean, all you should be caring about is results. And the, your digital agency, like whoever you decide to pick to do your optimization, it's so critical that they know these dates and this information. So for example, the latest major update happened on May 21st, 2014, which was a panda update, which basically Google went again and looked at all the websites on the World Wide Web, and they said, do they generally have good content? And if they didn't, like if the content was too thin, meaning it wasn't enough content, maybe it was too much breathe the fold, maybe it was just regurgitated content, but Google has its own factors to kind of determine is this content really relevant and is it good, is it engaging, and all that good stuff. And if it wasn't, you probably got hit with this penalty that happened on May 21st, 2014. This is why it's so critical, the digital agency that you guys decide to go with, it's so critical that they actually track and measure to see how your website is performing on a daily basis. Not to say that you need to know every single day how your website's ranking, you know, most brands and businesses like to get a monthly report that kind of shows them a summary, but your agency needs to be looking at this at a daily level. And here's the reason why. So for example, on May 21st, when the algorithm update happened, it would be so critical for your agency to look at your website on May 21st or even on May 22nd to see did your rankings fall on that particular day or, or the few days after that. Because if the answer is yes, and for the majority of your keyword phrases, all of a sudden you've dropped off the face of Google, it's no longer a guessing game. I mean, otherwise we could, somebody would just blindly say, well, let's build more links and let's do that. But really, it was nothing to do with the links. In this particular case, it was to do with content. And we know if we went to your website and updated it with fresh content, added new content, fixed the pages that had thin content, maybe even changed the position of where the content was, Maybe the website had too many banners on the on the on, on the site. But for whatever reason, just made those changes. You would recuperate your rankings. So, again, the the point we're trying to make is you don't have to memorize these dates and these algorithm updates. Your SEO agency, this is like their responsibility. So one of the factors that I would be looking at when deciding which SEO agency to pick is do they have the ability to track how my website is doing on a daily basis? Because if they're not it makes it really impossible for them to realize what was the algorithm update that happened within that month that might have impacted the website. Okay, so just moving along over here in terms of another big update that happened last year was something called the Hummingbird update. And basically what Hummingbird is, just in a nutshell, I'm not sure if you guys remember Ask Jeeves, the old search engine, the butler guy, or the new version would be Siri, which is, you know, you could pick up your phone and talk to your phone and just say, hey, where is the closest pizza store to me? So Google is essentially taking how we're talking as human people, not as keyword phrases now, but how we're just naturally talking and typing into their search engine to help better understand what your website is really about. So the example that I always like using is my, my phone because I've got a horrible um, track record with my iPhones. And I say iPhones because either A, like I, I lose them or B or, or I break them. So if I find a nice case, I'll never break my iPhone, but I end up losing it. So anyways, that's just my situation. But anyways, having that said, when I go into, let's just say I broke my, my phone, and if I ask you guys, hey, I cracked my iPhone screen, do you know where I could get it fixed? Or I dropped my iPhone, where could I get it fixed? Or I broke my iPhone, uh, where could I get it repaired? I just asked you three different questions, but your answer to me should not change. You might say, yeah, there's Bob's shop on 44th Avenue, and you know he's got great rates, great service, and he'll probably get it back to you within 24 hours. So your answer is going to be the same. Right now, Google's trying to do that, because right now, they're treating all those three questions I asked you as three separate queries or different keyword phrases in which you will get different results. That's when the past they always said, well, optimize for one keyword phrase per page, meaning 
you should write a page on iPhone repair shop and iPhone repair store and fix iPhone screen and, and broken iPhone screen. And, but then they realize how many times could you regurgitate the same information over and over and make it engaging and compelling. What ended up happening on the web is people started doing this and started dumping out all sorts of crap content just to try to rank for every single possible phrase that all people might type it in. And Google's like, wait a second. We now, you know, they're, they're getting much better at it. So even though the results will still be different now, close and close to their understanding what your website is about. So over time, when you're speaking to an SEO company, there's no, no longer going to be things like we're going to be optimizing for 10 keyword phrases or 20 keyword phrases because those keyword phrases will not exist. It's about the theme of your website because naturally your website could be found for hundreds of thousands of different keywords that Google understands what your business is actually about. And how to do that, you obviously have to build trust and authority in Google and this obviously through writing great content and getting great links to your sources and so forth. Um, very, very common that we hear is about local optimization. So again, this would be applicable to those brands or businesses that, you know, when you do a search for your product or your service and you see like a map listing, like the A, B, C, D, E, F listing show up right inside Google. Well, I mean, we could spend a whole day again in terms of how to get there and how to maximize that, but just for the sake of this webinar, the quick, quick things that you guys should be doing as a very, very basic thing, or at least your consultant or your agency should be doing, is making sure that your business is submitted to all the local, what we call citation websites in your region or country. So for example, some of the popular ones in the US is things like, is your business on City Search and Insider Pages and Yelp and Skidoo and Bing and Foursquare and Google Places, Yahoo Local, Bing Local, so forth and so forth. I mean, this will help Google understand you are indeed a local business. Number two, you want to make sure that when your business is submitted to all these different channels, it's consistent. If they're using different phone numbers, Google will treat them as different businesses and you will not get the same credit. If in some cases your web address, if you're putting the www and some of your profiles are not, even though we as humans will translate, a, translate that as the same website, Google will not. They'll treat it as different businesses. Even to the point of your company name, like if you're putting in, you know, your company name, in some cases you're putting limited or incorporated at the end, again, Google will treat it as different companies. So not only do you want to make sure that you're listed here, number two, you want to make sure that all your information is accurate and consistent there. And last but not least, when you are creating a profiles on these channels, they do ask you a lot of questions. The more you take the time to complete your listing to 100%, the higher the probability you will rank locally better in those map lists. So for example, when you're setting up a Google Places page, it will ask you things like, all right, give us your business name, give us a description about your business. Give us your categories. You could choose up to like five. So don't just put one category. Put up to five categories. So say, okay, what's your hours of operation? Do you have any photos of your business? Do you have any videos of your business? So again, the more photos, the more videos, all that stuff. These are all small, small factors, but it will all add up and give you a higher probability of you to rank better. Okay, so how do you outrank our competition this is another common question that we get asked is because they're like, hey, look, you know, our competitors, they're on Google, but, you know, we've got a better product, we've got better pricing, we've got better warranty. We hear this all the time, but how do we do better than them? Well, number one, first of all, you need to understand how, is, how are you, your website performing in Google's eyes. So, for example, here's a good example of a prospect that came to us, this is a couple months back now, in the UK. They wanted to be ranked for the term tennis racket and things of that nature. So we looked at these keyword phrases that they've given us and we looked at these two columns. The first column is showing how they're ranking at the country level, like all across google.co.uk. If I type in uh, tennis rackets, we know that there's 10 listings on page one of Google, there's the next 10 on page two of Google, and since they're ranking at 23, we know that they're sitting at the top of page three of Google for that phrase. And the next one, they're in position number 28. And the next one, they're in position number 30. And for the rest of the phrases, they're not on the first five pages of Google. And then we also track at a local level. Because they had a brick and mortar store, they want to get local in-store foot traffic. So in the city of Le Leicester, I believe that's how to pronounce it, you can see that, that how they're ranking there. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're ranking number 23 or 28 or 30 or 500 for that matter. If you're not on page one of Google, 
I mean, 91% of traffic does not go past page one of Google. So regardless if you're like 11 or 600, it's essentially the same thing. You're not being found. So number one, we check to see how are they currently behaving. And then our platform gives us the ability to look at who is ranking on page one of Google for their keyword phrases. Because if you want to be ranked on page one, you obviously have to knock someone off that first page of real estate. And then a platform is smart enough to determine, well, of all the phrases that we're going for, who are your main competitors that are kind of dominating for most of your keyword phrases? In this case, you can see there's pro direct to tennis.com and tennisnuts.com, especially tennis nuts. I mean, they've done such an excellent job in Google that it doesn't matter what type of things that you talk about tennis, they're usually within the top three positions of Google for virtually every single type of keyword phrase. So they've done a phenomenal job in building that trust and authority to Google that they deserve to rank there. Now this is where it gets very interesting, where we could do something called reverse SEO, where we could take a look at tennisnet.com and kind of backwards engineer well, where are they building their content, how are they getting it syndicated, what sites are they submitting it to, are they doing press releases, are they doing guest blogging, are they getting links from sponsors? And, and we could scrape all this data, which helps us, our team, to determine when we are submitting links to your website and building links, where exactly should we build them from? Because, I mean, for example, let's just look at the term, um, again, I'll use that first one, dentist in Toronto. If I'm going to be ranking the term dentist in Toronto and, uh, and look at the top ten websites in Google that are ranking, and all these dentists, they all have a, a listing on superpages.com, but I don't have my listing on superpages.com. I mean, it's all, now it's almost common sense for me to say, wow, you know what? They all have something in common. Google is ranking them for a reason. They've got a link pointing to their website that I don't currently have. I now know I need as a minimum to get that one link and that one listing and fill up my profile on superpages.com. So again, this is why it's so critical. Your digital agency that you pick and choose to work with They've got not only the skills to do this, but the technology and the platform that allows us to, to actually effectively get this done. I mean, we even took it one step further. We even looked at things like their social profiles and so forth. We'll, we'll do a whole separate webinar on this. Because right now, I mean, it doesn't matter how many Facebook followers or Twitter followers and so forth that you have. It doesn't have a direct influence on your ranking. But over time, I mean, your, your social influence will have a major, major role of who actually wins the SEO battles in our prediction. So we'll, we'll do a separate webinar on that. But just some quick tips for you guys. If you guys want to go ahead and look at some free tools that you could use to kind of see what your competitors are doing, you could break these tools down. They're called keywordspy.com and spyfoo.com. Um, and if you've not used these tools before, basically what they will allow you to do is you can go ahead and plug in your competitor's name, uh, sorry, your plug in your competitor's web address, and it will actually show you uh, things like what keyword phrases they're bidding for, what's their average position on page search marketing, what do their ad copies look like. So it shows you a whole bunch of great, great data that allows you, because look, if you're going to do page search marketing, you obviously have to write better ads than your competitors. I mean, I would rather pay less for my clicks, be underneath them, but have much more compelling ads than I get the clicks versus them. And in order for you to do that, you need to kind of know, well, what are they doing? What are the phrases that they're bidding for and all that good stuff? These two tools will allow you to do it absolutely for free. Um, so again, just to kind of show you an example of how to write better ad copies, even though this is not pay-per-click stuff, just the thought process behind this I thought is pretty genius. And I always like using this example. Um, this goes back to as a campaign in the UK. and. This is saying, congratulations, Adi, for winning South African Car of the Year 2006 from the winner of World Car of the Year 2006. So this is like BMW kind of taking a little job at Audi for that. Well, Audi then wrote back saying, congratulations to BMW for winning World Car of the Year 2006 from the winner of six consecutive Le Mans 24-hour races. So now Audi just kind of took another a job back at BMW. In fact. All you went all out, like all their campaigns, everything that they did, because now everyone kind of knew about the rivalry and so forth. So even when Audi had a billboard up there, it just basically said, you're a move, BMW, the entirely new Audi A4. Like how cool, I mean, first of all, how gutsy is that? Like you, you, you're paying for a big billboard ad, and you're advertising one of your competitors' name in there. Now, again, it depends on which part of the world you're from and so forth. There's things that you can and can't say about other brands. But regardless of this, I just love the thought process of, 
um, how they're actually all trying to write better in quotation ads than each other. So this is Audi's ad, your move BMW, the entire new Audi A4. And take a look at how cool this is. Look at what BMW did. So this is their, what I call their ad copy, and they put a billboard right across the street, and all it reads is checkmate. So again, kind of cool, um, at least in my, in my opinion anyways, I always get a kick out of this. But again, it's just the, the, the message here is making sure that your ad copies are actually better than your competitors. Okay, so what else could you do to outrank a competition? Well, here's, here's something very clear. So I'm, I'm not sure if you guys have seen this before. Where if, you have, if you're writing blogs on your website, you definitely want to set up something called Google authorship. Now, even though Google kind of moved away with this very recently, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment, but basically what Google authorship is, it allows you to tell Google that whoever's writing the blog, that there's a real person, an author behind it, and they kind of get credibility for it. And in the past, it kind of used to look like this, where you see someone's face uh, that comes up right in the search engine result page. This was extremely, extremely effective because if you're looking at text ads, think about it, pretend these are all ads. The first thing that we see as humans is images. So naturally, our eyes are going to get drawn towards the photos there. And the people that got higher click-throughs were the people that actually had photos. So there's a lot of speculation now because Google just recently removed this. They even had reports showing that how effective this stuff was, how it's so much better for your clicks, which we all know is true as well. But if, the, if this area is getting more clicks, that means somewhere else is getting less clicks. We're speculating it's because of the ads that they have on Google. So if they're losing ad revenue because people are clicking here versus clicking on their advertisers, because advertisers, you cannot put images in your ads unless you're like shopping car and you have an e-commerce and you know you have Google Shopping. That's different. But for everything else, it's just text-based ads. Um, until they allow images, you know they're losing potential revenue. Anyways, that's that's the that's whole that's Google's whole uh, whatever they want to say about that. But at the end of the day, it's still Google authorship. It's still effective because you can still configure it, which will then allow Google to realize that you're an author. But here's the cool part about all this stuff. I went ahead and searched for best iPhone app. And you could define your title tags and your description tags, which is the first thing that people see, which is the title tag is that blue area at the top, which says the 100 best iPhone apps. And the description is view your new apps underneath. There's that little two or three sentences or lines that you actually see there. Now, basically what's happening here is if you're taking a look at the, your titles and your descriptions. The most common thing people try to do is stuff their keyword phrases in there. Well, yes, you want your keyword phrase in there because you want to get ranking Google, but you also want to get people to click on you. So if you could write compelling, it's, it's kind of like an art and a science again. Well, how, how do you get your title in there, for, so your keyword in there, and still make it compelling? Well, again, if I'm looking at the best iPhone app, take a look at the first one, the 100 best iPhone apps. People love numbers. And if you look at the, if you want to, the third one, 20 best iPhone and iPad apps this week. I mean, this was just posted 20 hours ago. So if I want something recent, fresh, and new, I'm going ahead and, and looking, clicking on that link. Or how about this one underneath? 15 best iPhone apps you're not using. So this is now building my curiosity, like, hmm, maybe I never even heard of these awesome apps, and maybe I want to check that out. So each one of these three people that have written these titles and descriptions, descriptions have done an extremely effective job. They're obviously catering towards different types of people. Some people on recency, some people on curiosity, and some people that just want a massive list. But regardless, it's all effectively done. Um, so how else could you, what else could you do to dominate Google? Well, here's the thing. If you have content that you're posting to your website, especially blog content, the number one mistake is people don't take that content and actually share it on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and their own Google Plus page. These are just some starters. And I get it because we all think get business owners coming up to us saying, look, I've got a tough enough time just managing my website. Are you telling me now I've got to be on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest? Like, Who's got time for all this stuff? Which I know it sounds very overwhelming, but at the same time, there's a lot of ways to automate this entire process. So again, if you were having a blog, you can set up so it automatically goes ahead and posts to your main social profile. That's the very, very minimum thing you could actually do to, um, to actually get uh, social signals and stuff back to your website and building credibility. 
I personally think one of the most overlooked social platforms out there is Google Plus. I mean, it's kind of foolish not to be using Google Plus if you want to be ranked in Google. And I'll show you how effective this is. This is when I was back in Hawaii. I was signed into my Google account, and I'll show you what I posted on the screen. All I wrote was, I'm at a digital marketing convention in Hawaii, and here are the presenters. And I wrote Doug Schatz, we wrote Krista, we had Frank from Google there, and we had myself there. And this is, this is a post that I put on my personal Google Plus wall. Then what I did was I called up Ryan from our Waterloo office here in Canada. I said, hey, Ryan, do you mind doing me a favor? Do you mind going into your Google and searching for digital marketing convention in Hawaii and taking a screenshot of what you see and do you mind sending it back to me? So he went ahead and did that and take a look at what he saw. I mean, if you take a look at the search results now, you can see that number two listing there, and I'll zoom in a bit. It's, so he, remember, keep in mind, he signed into his account. It shows that one minute ago, he typed in digital market convention in Hawaii. It's showing right there on page one that fast. So again, I'm not trying to sell magic beans or some, some type of weird stuff that's going to make you guys think that within minutes you're going to be on page one of Google. No, there's two things I want to point out here. Look how quick and fast Google indexes information. This is, I mean, within one minute, they were able to grab that content. If you publish content on your website versus putting it on your Google page as well, Google will never know about it until they go back to your website. But Google Plus, they'll know about it instantly. Second of all, yes, this is only going to show up on Ryan's profile because he's part of my friend's network on Google Plus. But again, as a brand, or even as an individual, if you start getting more followers on Google Plus, encouraging your fans to follow you, on Google, there's a strong probability then when you go ahead and put in content on your on your wall that those people when they're signed into their Google account, and I, again I don't know the percentages of how many people are signed in, the number changes all the time. But I mean regardless, I mean some people use Gmail, you have to be signed into YouTube when you when you want, want to write comments. But there's so many people that just use Google anyways for Google Apps and Google Docs and Google Drive. But so if you're already signed into your Google account, you could be reaching out to all those people and being in their search engine result page instantly. Like this is fast. And and I know some people might be thinking, well, digital marketing convention in Hawaii, what a long term keyword phrase. And you're right. It was a long term keyword phrase and I just did it for the sake of seeing did this actually work this fast and it did. But I told Ryan, could you do a search for digital marketing convention, which has fifty two million websites uh, competing for that phrase. So have the term digital marketing which has 781 million websites. So how about just the term marketing, which has over 521 million websites that are all competing for that keyword phrase. And each one of these three scenarios, my listing on Ryan's machine was ranking number two or number three respectively. And we'll talk about within minutes of me posting it. So this was again when I was back in Idaho. This was just a couple of weeks ago as well. Same thing, I was doing a training seminar there and, and Doug was there, so just took a quick photo. And I did the same thing. I'm like, hey, if you're looking for a hotel in Coeur d'Alene, you have to check out the Coeur d'Alene Resort. Just check in at the conference center. So I typed this on my Google wall, did the same spiel to Ryan. He went ahead and did a search for a hotel in Coeur d'Alene. And you could see right there on page one is my listing. And this was within five minutes. Google had already indexed it. And it was already showing up on Ryan's search engine result page. So again, very, very powerful to use Google Plus in your business. Um, okay, so just to wrap a few things up, we're almost done here. What's better than being ranked number one in Google? Well, what if your website's ranking number one and your Facebook page is ranking number two and your YouTube video is ranking number three and your Twitter feed is ranking number four? I mean, when you get multiple listings on page one of Google, you start to dominate and start to own that space where it doesn't matter if someone's clicking one, two, three, or four, or five. It's your phone number, your call to action, and your message. And Keep in mind, every single time you get another listing in Google, you are knocking one of your competitors off that first page of real estate. So videos are always a great, great way of doing that. I mean, generally speaking, it always depends on the keyword phrase, but on average, you know, we typically get a, a video ranking on page one of Google within a week. And, and the reason why is because for websites, it's just so competitive. Like we said, it could take three months, six months, nine months, a year. There's so many variables with videos. There's not that many people that are actually still producing videos and quality videos that are talking about your topics and keyword phrases that you actually wish to rank for. So 
just to kind of summarize this right now, uh, our advice to everyone here on the call, like we, all the business owners that, that took the time of your business, I know we, <laughs> even though I felt like I was speaking to this, I, I, I'm well over the time, but again, still surprised that majority of you guys have stuck through. Um, so thank you again for that. Uh, we always like to pitch the concept of crawl before you walk, before you run. You could so easily blow a lot of money in digital marketing. It makes sense before you just pitch so much, so money at it with all these different things. You know, test things first, see what works better, and then improve from there. I mean, we've had brands that we were given, you know, like a hundred thousand dollars a month to work with, which we said, you know what? Actually, before we take your hundred thousand dollar budget, let's do a quick campaign for sixty days for twenty thousand dollars. We want to see what's working effectively, and based on what our strategies are there, we could then do a roadmap for the next six months or nine months or a year. So it doesn't matter if your brand could afford $100 a month or 1000 or 10000 or 100000 It's all still the same principle and the same concept where we like proof of concept. And, of course, if you're seeing that ROI and you're using your analytics to measure this, um, you will obviously increase your digital spend and you'll continue to see growth in your company. So as a final, final takeaway, um, again, if I had to do some action items, Number one is if you currently do not have a mobile-friendly website or it doesn't look well or it's your website's already outdated and you want to kill two birds with one stone, speak to your local consultant that brought you on the call today um, in terms of finding out more information about pricing and packages uh, and how they could assist you in terms of getting that done. And of course, anything else that we've talked about here, if you do need help, again, your consultant is there. To, to advise you on that. In case in the event you got brought to this webinar without a consultant, um, you could go ahead and I'll actually put up my contact details. It's right there. Uh, it's on the screen. And uh, you can also check out some of the videos that we've done on YouTube. Um, we've done some stuff on social media, like how to build Facebook fans and things like that. So um, I'll leave that on the screen for a couple seconds. but. I don't think just for the sake of time, I know we're well over now, um, so if you do have any specific questions that you do want to address to me personally, you can again always send me an email to that address and CC your consultant um, and we'll work with you in getting back your responses. So, wow, that's quite a mouthful <laughs> from beginning to end. So thank you everyone for sticking with me on this webinar. Um, but again, if, if you are a, a consultant that was brought here, again, we always appreciate your guys' feedback as well. Um, so please give us that. And thank you so much. Shoot us an email. We're looking forward to talking to you and doing business with you. Enjoy the rest of the week, everyone. Take care. Bye.